So I would like to ask you a question today. Have you ever had an earworm? <laughs> Uh, I know it sounds interesting, and, and I, I'm willing to uh, bet that almost everybody that is uh, listening uh, today has had an earworm at one time or another. And uh, most likely, uh, many of us have had multiple earworms uh, every year. I know that I do. Uh, do. Do you know what an earworm is? It, if you ever got an earworm, the good news is you, you don't need any antifungal <laughs> to get the earworm out or any oral medication for treatment. You just need to play a new song. <laughs> uh, an earworm is uh, that uh, officially a term that is used uh, for that catchy tune that gets stuck in your head. <laughs> That's what an earworm is. And it gets stuck there and in your head, and it plays over and over again. And it can really get difficult to get rid of. And you've had this experience, I'm sure, right? You, you've enjoyed this. <laughs> it's called an earworm. And uh, I hate it when that happens. And I'm sorry if I do this to you, but uh, let me help you. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. No, no. Okay. Uh, dun I know, I know there's probably some parents or grandparents or even kids, and I'm so sorry to do this to you. Baby shark, do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, you get that, you get it, right? And it's a, it gets stuck in your head, and 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 the reason that uh, I bring this up. <laughs> Uh, is because we sometimes get a thought stuck in our head that should not be there. And, uh, and, and the thought that I want to talk about today is the thought that we just are alone and that we just need to live this life alone and worry about myself. I mean, that's it. And, uh, and we, we want to live in isolation. That we don't need anybody else. And I think that we need to probably play a different tune in our ear. Uh, there was a study conducted by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. It was released several years ago, uh, and it revealed that Americans have less people who they can confide in than past generations. Very interesting. I mean, the average American has uh, three people in their uh, uh, that the people in their life that they can confide in in the beginning of the study. And then 10 years later, that number dropped from three people to two people. And perhaps even more striking is the number of Americans who state that they have no close friends, uh, 10%. And then it went to 24.6% within 10 years. Now that is even before a worldwide pandemic and who knows <laughs> what that has done to us. And, and, and when, we, when we talk about this, uh, there's, no, uh, there, there's no shortage in the church either. It's all too common for Christians to, to live this way. We neglect to build strong and lasting and meaningful relationships with others. I mean, we know people, and uh, we, if we're, we're here at church, sometimes we see them every week, uh, but too often we fail to nurture the relationships uh, beyond, hey, how you doing today? Hey, good to see you. Have a great week. We are going to be transitioning starting next week into a different focus. It'll still be the concept of one at a time, but it'll actually hone in on developing those relationships. And we're going to be uh, uh, talking uh, about uh, five everyday ways that we can love our neighbors and change the world. And, and they're all based around developing these relationships. And uh, this book is by Dave and John Ferguson. And, and one of the lines on the back of the book of the jacket, it says, uh, but what if there were more organic, more authentic ways to share your faith with your friends, neighbors, and coworkers? And, and this concept is so important uh, about developing relationships and sharing who we are in our lives 
in, in, in investing and in influencing the lives of others. And so today I want to I wanna talk about some things that we can do to develop and it's kind of scratch the surface a little bit of this uh, uh, series that we're transitioning to and uh, th- to develop these lasting friendships and these lasting relationships. And in order to do that, I want to look at the Apostle Paul today for an example of this. You know, the Apostle Paul had lots of friendships. I mean, I mean it, they're sprinkled all throughout his writings, and uh, we see that them in the book of Acts. But I want to talk about one particular one. One of Paul's closest friends was a young man for whom he had provided mentorship, and his name was Timothy. And he, and he and Paul had a great friendship, and he invested in Timothy's life. They had some turmoil, and yet they had reconciliation. And so, so two of the letters in the New Testament are actually addressed to Timothy. And the second letter was written shortly before Paul was executed at the end of his life under the emperor Nero. And it contains words of a man that is pouring out his heart for one of his dearest friends. And I think there's some lessons that we can learn as a part of this. Uh, And and so I want to take a look at those lessons a little more closely here this morning and uh, and just talk about them. Uh, I I see four things that we could probably emulate in our lives that, that Paul gives us in the very beginning of this letter of 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, you can go there and and, and join us. Uh, The first one is this, and and I don't think this is going to be any surprise because we have talked about this, uh, especially in this series, over and over and over. And and we we began the year with it, and uh, and that is, uh, if we're going to develop friendships and relationships and, and that we're going to be doing more than just trying to get converts, but we want to actually bless people uh, like uh, we're going to talk about in the next uh, few weeks. First of all, we need to pray for them. Pray for them. And this may seem obvious, uh, but think about it. How often do we pray for those who are closest to us, our friends? And, and many of us pray for our friends maybe only when they're going through conflict. And don't get me wrong, that is a perfect time to be praying for our friends when they're going through conflict. Uh, but that shouldn't be the only time we pray for our friends. We need, to, we need to follow Paul's example. And this is what he says in verse 3 of, of uh, uh, here of 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 3 it says this, Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayer. In my prayers. Night and day, I constantly remember you. And, and I think that the key word in this is probably the word constantly. Uh, make it a habit of praying for your friends and those closest to you. Uh, pray for everything that you know about them. Pray, pray for their marriage. Pray for their work. Pray for their health and their finances, their happiness, their holiness. Pray for their usefulness, everything that you can think of. And if we want to go deeper and dive into prayer for, for those around us in our friendships, you can go back in the, on our YouTube page uh, for Lakeshore Christian Church and go back to the, uh, um, the June 4th uh, uh, um, message that we started the series with. And there is a passage of scripture about how to pray for people, anyone and everyone. So so you want to develop strong friendships. I think it all begins, and we're going to do a deeper dive into this next Sunday, but it all begins with prayer. And and, uh, we got to talk, we got to be talking about our friends. Not to other people, but we need to be talking to God about our friends as often as possible. Here's the second thing that I noticed from Paul's letter here to his uh, dear friend, Timothy, and that is, we really need to know the hurts. We have to know the hurts. Paul says first, in verse 4, he says, recalling your tears, I long to see you. That's code, right? Recalling your tears. I'm not sure what the cause of of Timothy's tears. We have no idea, but Paul knows. He knows. He was Timothy's friend, and in the same way, we need to know what is going on in our friends' lives. Now, we're going to discuss this a little more over the next few weeks. We we 
know to know about their hurts. We need to know that. And we need to be aware of their tears. Uh, I mean, think about your own life. You've got worries, right? Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, we did one need at a time here. And we we wrote down needs on a card. And I got to tell you, everybody, everybody, everybody has needs, problems and challenges and difficulties that we face. We all do. And uh, if you're like most people, you're facing um, the, the things pretty much on your own. <laughs> you're trying to carry all that on your own. And, and, and you're carrying these things on your own shoulders and keeping all the cares to yourself. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if there was someone in your life who was aware of what's going on, who can, listen, without meddling, I think that's a key, without meddling, show their concern and their support. Someone who can say, I understand. Someone who can say, I care. And you can be that type of friend for somebody else. When Sam Rayburn, who uh, was the Speaker of the House of Representatives back way back in the 1940s and the 1950s, he learned early one morning that a teenage daughter of uh, one of his friends had died suddenly during the night. And immediately he went to his uh, friend's house and he knocked on the door. And, and when the uh, grief-stricken man came to the door, Sam Rayburn said, I I just came to see what I could do to help. And the father said, yeah, thank you for coming. But there's really, there's nothing you can do. We're, we're in here and we're making the arrangements now. And, uh, and Sam Rayburn said, well, have you had your morning coffee? <laughs> and uh, uh, the father said, no, I, we haven't had breakfast. It just, it, it's just been one of those days. And and Sam Rainbird said, well, at least I can make coffee. And he went in and he was making coffee. And while he was in there in the kitchen putting some things together, uh, the grief-stricken father come in and he said, I, it just dawned on me, Mr. Speaker, I, I thought you were supposed to be having breakfast today at the White House with the president. To which Sam said, yeah, I was supposed to, but uh, I called the president and told him that uh, I had a friend who was in need and, and, and it's okay. That's the kind of friends we need, right? The ones that would drop everything. That's the kind of friends that we need to be. Uh, so we got to know the hurts. We got we got to start with prayer. We got to know their hurts, be, and then that only comes with the third thing. That comes from spending time together, spending time with 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 people. Paul said in verse four, "I long to see you." <laughs> so that I may be filled with joy. I long to see you, uh, to, to spend time with you. Nothing beats spending time when it comes to building relationships. And think of all the, think of all the movies that uh, maybe you've seen that, that illustrate this principle. You know, we, a couple of guys hate each other, and, and somehow, <laughs> through the, the, the course of the movie, they're stuck together, right? They're, 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 they're proximity, and they're, they're stuck together. And by the end of the film, they're, they're great buddies. I mean, we see this illustrated. Well, this is a habit that uh, would benefit all of us. I mean, instead of watching the game alone... <laughs> uh, why not invite a friend over to watch it with you? Instead of having uh, lunch or dinner alone, uh, ask someone to join you. So Paul says here, he says in verse 4, I long to see you so, so that I may be filled with joy. His, his joy was de- uh, derived from his relationships with others. And this is an important part of the Christian life. The Christian life is not just a not just a vertical relationship between you and God. I mean that is the most important, but it is also a horizontal relationship between you and others, all of us. And in order to thrive as a disciple, as a fully committed Christ follower, then we need relationships in our lives. We need friendships in our lives. And so here's the fourth one that uh, I see uh, that we need to do in order to build better friendships, better relationships, uh, and, and that we see from Paul's letter here, and that is this. We need to be an, an encourager. 
We need to be an encourager, especially in this world that is so discouraging sometimes. We need to bring, bring that light. I, I love uh, stories that I hear uh, uh, in the Bible of Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? He had a uh, kind of a, was known a, f- f- to be the son of encouragement. <laughs> I mean, that's what I want to be known as, right? Someone who encourages other, others. So uh, be an encourager. Uh, and Paul encouraged Timothy. He goes on in the text in verses uh, 6 through 8 here. And this is, this is what uh, he writes in his letter to Timothy. And for this, reason, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about the Lord. You see, he was to encourage him to fan the flame that began in him, to to keep on going, never give up, always keep moving. And one of Paul's objectives in writing this letter was to inspire Timothy, to strengthen him in the, the task of ministry that he was involved with. He, he faced many obstacles in his work in Ephesus. And he was young, and, and, and the church there was facing a lot of opposition. And Paul wanted to encourage Timothy, don't give up. Don't give up. That's what friends need to do. We, we, we need to offer encouragement and support to one another. You know what happens, uh, when a boxer uh, goes to the corner between rounds, I mean, he's getting all beat up, right, in the, in the boxing ring, and, and, the, and the team gathers around him, and he starts dressing his wounds or keeping his muscles loose and offering encouragement, giving some advice. You can do this. Uh, you, you can win this fight. Watch for the, the left hook. Keep, keep the guard up. You can do it, and on and on. They, they keep doing this. Even if the fighter's getting beat, they give that encouragement. Every person needs one or two people in their corner. Encourage them to keep the fight. Especially when you're getting beat up by circumstances. We need encouragement and we need support. So I hope you have somebody doing this for you. Uh... But right now, I want, to, I want you to think of something even more important. There's probably one or two people in your life with whom you have a special influence. You're able to, to bring words uh, of encouragement. And your words carry more weight with them than anyone else. So don't be stingy with them. I, I mean, don't hold back in the encouragement Use your words generously. Be an encourager. Be an encourager. Many years ago, there was a, a coach at the University of UCLA, uh, Coach uh, Pepper Rogers. <laughs> Love that name, Pepper Rogers. And uh, he was the football coach at UCLA, and he was going through a terrible season, having all kinds of issues that season. And he was upset about it. And he didn't think his wife was being as encouraging as she needed to be. And he said, uh, my dog is my best friend. And I told my wife I needed at least two, uh, I needed at least two friends. And she told me to go out and buy another dog. (laughs) Listen, don't be, don't be the, the reason that someone has to go buy another dog, right? Robert uh, Lewis Stevenson said, A friend is a present you give to yourself. (laughs) Friends a present you give to yourself. Relationships are the oil of our existence. They're tough sometimes. Relationships are our work. They are. I think that's probably why a lot of us uh, try to live in isolation. It's easier just to go, this isn't worth it. But they're the oil of our existence. They, They make everything a little better when it's needed, a little smoother when it's needed. Someone said, friends, good friends make good times twice as good and bad times half as bad. You need to surround yourself with friends and you need to be the best friend you can be. And if you, uh, 
you can't name two or three people that you know well, people that you, you pray for constantly, people that uh, you spend time with constantly, people that, uh, that you know and they know, you know each other's hurts and struggles, Pe- people who love, uh, you love enough to encourage and to support, then I encourage you to ask God to fill your life with some close friendships and start being the friend to others that you need in yourself. You know, the fact is, we already have friends. I mean, we have acquaintances. We have people in our lives. And I'm not talking about uh, your social media and how many friends you have there. That's not friendship. (laughs) I hope the example that we've seen from the Apostle Paul's words and to his friend Timothy will encourage you to seek more from your friendships and your relationships, to build closer and stronger and durable relationships with people whom God has placed in your life. Uh, Let me pray for you and with you. Father, you did not create us to live in isolation. It's not how we're designed. And uh, sometimes we play that song over and over in our head that it sure would be a lot easier (laughs) to live that way, but uh, that's not how you created us. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to sing a new song, a song that where we develop relationships, that uh, we live in a way that we bless others and that others are a blessing to us. And when we live that way, we can change the world one at a time. And so, God, I just, I just pray for everyone who is joining us this, this day. And I pray, God, for a blessing in their life, the blessing of friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.